John Valava, thank you so much for being here today on the Living the Farm Life podcast. You have such a rich history both at Purdue and in the state of Indiana, first as a Purdue pharmacy student and now as the owner of Hooks Apothecary, a private compounding pharmacy in southwest Indiana. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. To get us started, can you tell us how you um, got started at Purdue? Uh, well, it was really kind of born into Purdue, if you will. So um, got a history of Purdue alums within the family. Um, my grandfather was actually uh, played football here, um, had the record uh, from what we always heard. He had the record for the longest fumble return for a touchdown by an offensive lineman in the Big Ten, supposedly. I don't know if that was actually true or not, but this was all back in the 20s. Um, and Purdue had just been in my life. I went to my first Purdue football game uh, when I was five or six uh, months old, um, just been at campus the whole time. And my parents um, said the whole time that I could go anywhere to college. That they, they weren't going to limit me to Purdue. They weren't going to say, this is where you have to go. But if I was going to go into pharmacy school, uh, it was going to be here. There was no other option. So, and that was, I, I was not against that. Um, both my parents were, were ardent Purdue fans. Um, we came up for football games all the time, a couple basketball games um, through my high school. And um, from an early age, I knew I wanted to be a pharmacist from fifth, sixth grade on. Uh, I was born into a family of pharmacists, uh, a couple sisters, a brother-in-law, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. Um, and so it was in my blood that I was going to do pharmacy. I didn't know what I was going to do with pharmacy, but I knew that this was going to be the career that I had. Um, and <clears throat> I don't know, it just, there, that, that struggle of figuring out what you wanted to do and where you wanted to go uh, never was uh, that for me. So um, it was just natural to come up here to West Lafayette and, and experience this. And um, what a great experience it was. And it's paid so many dividends uh, going forward in, in postgraduate um, life and uh, doing the things that we do within our pharmacy and within the industry and within our community. Do you come from a family of pharmacists? Yeah, um, it's a pretty deep family of pharmacists. My great-grandfather uh, was John A. Hook. Uh, he established Hook's Drug Stores here in, uh, in Indiana, in Indianapolis in 1900. Um, he grew that from one store to quickly a second store in 1902, 1903. That then ballooned to about 40 to 50 stores uh, until his son, August F. Hook, took over. Um, and Hook's Drug Stores... Uh, at its peak was about 300, 350 to 400 stores throughout a five-state area here in the Midwest. And so uh, strong, strong family history there. Um, my grandfather, uh, August, who everybody called Bud, we knew him in the family as T-Bird because he loved Thunderbirds. Um, he uh, had, a, had a storied career here at Purdue, uh, played football, played varsity football here in the 20s. He was actually played water polo too, of all things. Uh, they, Purdue had a water polo team back in the day. Um, and he had very, very strong ties to Purdue, and I think that's kind of where uh, my love of Purdue kind of started and kind of trickled down to me because he was a very proud Purdue alumni. Um, his daughter, my mother, was a very proud Purdue alumni, and it just trickled down for me. So you won't catch me in Evansville without some sort of Purdue paraphernalia on. In the wintertime, I've always got a Purdue jacket on. Uh, summertime, I've usually got some sort of Purdue polo on. It's it's just all, gone all the way down. And I heard you met your wife here at Purdue. Is that correct? Yep, we, we met here at Purdue. Um, it was kind of interesting. We're both from Evansville. We both went to different high schools. Um, and at that point, we were in a lot of the same things um, in high school. We were both in choir at our respective high schools. Um, I was a bit of a theater nerd. She knew some people in theater. She Actually, we come to find out she had seen me perform <laughs> at, at my high school. Um, you know, a couple years later, we've kind of realized all this, but um, in what is now P1, the first professional year, is actually when we met. Um, and, you know, kind of typical thing. We dated and went on from there. We got married um, in 2001 after we graduated and, and still together to this day. So it was one of those great, uh, a lot of stories you hear from, especially in the pharmacy school, a lot of, a lot of people meeting and meeting their true loves in, in pharmacy school and going on to marry them from there. We're, in our group, I think there's, we've got two or three that are in the same, same boat. So um, yeah, we've had a, we had a great history here, um, a lot of fun times. And uh, that basis of that that community of, ph of pharmacy love. We both love Purdue. We both love coming back to campus. We both love experiencing um, everything that has to go on with Purdue football games and everything like that. Um, so much so, we've we our first daughter, our eldest daughter, is now 
a, far, a freshman here in the BSPS program. So uh, we've kind of come full tilt from that standpoint. So, uh, But our three children are big Purdue fans, and we're sitting there watching basketball games all the time, coming up for football games all the time. So just a great sense of community we've always felt up here and continue to feel up here every time we come back up. Yeah. So what about you? Any any history of family of uh, pharmacists? Any parents, or what? What kind of brought you into pharmacy? What was what was the what was the precipice for you to, to pursue this as a as a career? Yeah, no pharmacists in my family, but my grandmother was a nurse. She worked in pediatric diabetes. Oh wow! And um, she used to we used to talk about patient cases, and she used to talk about her work and just the joy she felt from it was contagious. And she was a leading like expert in her field. She wrote the book quite literally <laughs> on pediatric diabetes. So it was really great for me to see her kind of as this woman taking charge in this field that originally didn't have that many women leading the charge. So she was a huge inspiration for me. Um, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do within healthcare. Nursing never really felt right to me. And then in my sophomore year of high, high school, I took a chemistry class and I loved it. I thought it was the coolest <laughs> thing. I had so much fun. And I told my teacher, I was like, this is really great. I don't know what I want to do, though. She asked me if I had ever considered pharmacy. And I was like, eh, I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. That seems like a lot of standing in a CVS or a Walgreens. I'm not sure if that's for me. And she was like, no, no, there's so much more to it than that. Like, that's a great way to go, but there's so many other things you can do, too. And then from there, I'm a very type A person, so I did all the research. I made myself a spreadsheet, even. That's right, I made a spreadsheet. It was a color-coded spreadsheet, too. Um, I actually still have it. I look at it every once in a while, and I'm like, wow, my spreadsheet skills have really advanced <laughs> since then. Um, but it was really like my grandmother's influence and then my high school chemistry teacher that got me into pharmacy and pharmacy got me here today. Awesome. I've heard a lot of stories like that, that it's not so much the family that's pushing you into pharmacy or you see that history of pharmacy within the family, but it's a lot of um, the love of chemistry. Obviously, you have to have that, but I, I've heard over and over again from students that there, there was that influ influential teacher that was in their life um, somewhere along the line that kind of gave them that spark and said, here's something you might be interested in. So that's awesome. That's great to hear. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So Hooks Apothecary is a compounding pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me more about what a compounding pharmacy means, especially in comparison to a traditional community pharmacy? Yeah. So when we talk about compounding pharmacy, we're really talking about a pharmacy that is specialized in customizing medications for patients. That's really kind of the broad 50,000 foot view of what we do. So um, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, what we work with um, is taking raw materials, raw chemicals, and transforming those into dosage forms for the patients that we serve. It's really kind of back to the future, um, if you will. If we think about pharmacy practice in the turn of the, of the 20th century, 1900s through really kind of the 1940s, that's what pharmacists did. They got powders from the drug manufacturers um, and they would manipulate those drugs into tablets, into suspensions, into suppositories. Um, whatever the prescriber wanted or in some cases, whatever the prescriber said, okay, this patient needs this drug, pharmacist, you figure out what's the best dosage for them and they would. Um, when mass manufacturing came online with lilies and uh, roaches and, and those manufacturers, that part of pharmacy really kind of fell away. But it was always still part of pharmacy practice. Even we went through um, up into the early 80s, it was always still there. It just was practice on a, on a much smaller scale. And in the most part was, um, at that point, became the manip manipulating of finished drug dosage products, tablets and capsules and things like that, and making them into something that uh, the patient needed. Um, in the early 1980s, uh, a company was started out of Houston, uh, Professional Compounding Centers of America, that really brought back to the forefront compounding as it was practiced at the turn of the century. And in those 40 to 50 years now that we've been from the establishment of PCCA, uh, we've got uh, about, I would guess, a good eight to 900 pharmacies across the country that just specialize 
in compounding, and that's what we do at Hooks Apothecary. Um, we don't fill what we call the traditional medications. We don't do um, what a typical retail pharmacy, community-based pharmacy would do. We are solely focused just on compounding. And from that standpoint, what that means is that um, we really have the ability to Im impact uh, any facet of medicine uh, that comes across, be it dermatology, um, gastroenterology, OBGYN, pediatrics. Really, every day is a new adventure when we when we go to work because we don't know what that next question is going to be, what that next prescription is going to be walking in the door. Um, and we really specialize um, in manipulating um, those drugs into dosage forms that are going to be um, more specialized to the patient, either from a palatability standpoint um, or from a dosage form that's going to be something that's going to be more uh, easier for the patient to take, or in our case, one of the biggest um, parts of our business is veterinary compounding. Um, as you can imagine, with, with pets and animals, um, there's not a lot of dosage forms outside of tablets and capsules um, that, are, are, that are out there, and these patients specifically need specific doses or they need a new dosage form. If you've ever tried to give a tablet to a cat, that's always an adventure of its own. Um, so we do a lot of work with our local veterinarians to do transdermal medications for cats or liquids for dogs, or we've treated guinea pigs and pet rats, and we work with the zoo and do things for the rhino and the elephants and the penguins that are there. So it's, it's really a fun, it's a really a fun uh, facet of pharmacy because you get to really touch a lot of different uh, facets of medicine that I don't feel like you get to have that ability to do uh, at a traditional retail uh, pharmacy practice. Yeah, that's really because I had no idea about the uh, the veterinary aspect of compounding. So that's nope. really, really cool. Um, not only have you owned your own business, but you've worked in a lot of different areas of the pharmacy profession. Could you tell me what your career path has looked like? Oh, it's, it's not a straight line for sure. <laughs> um, so one of the stories that we talked about today within the, within the leadership forum, um, just the ability to take your pharmacy degree and go wherever from that. And getting that experience within the pharmacy school early on and, and opening your eyes to what possibilities are out there are very, is very, very important. So when I started in pharmacy, um, I really, when I started in pharmacy school here at Purdue, my, my main goal was to go work for Walgreens and climb the corporate ladder and be something in leadership in Chicago. And that was where I saw my uh, professional life kind of developing and going towards. Um, I quickly kind of realized in talking with um, people that came through Purdue that gave presentations and getting some experience into the community retail pharmacy, um, that probably wasn't going to be a good fit for me. I had kind of an entrepreneurial bent to myself. Um, I had that kind of that feeling that I wanted to own my own thing and, and work um, in pharmacy in that, in that capacity. Um, so over the course of a year, I kind of thought, well, Walgreens may not be, or any corporate job may not really be the, where I really want to go. Um, and part of that too is I, I realized I was going to lose that touch uh, of patient care very, very quickly if I went that route. And so uh, at my time at Purdue, we had a uh, professor of nuclear pharmacy named Dr. Stanshaw, um, and he opened my eyes to nuclear pharmacy, and that felt like where I was wanting to go. That was the opportunity to uh, the possibility of owning my own radio pharmacy and, and operating um, in that space. And I love nuclear medicine. Or I love nuclear pharmacy. I loved everything about nuclear pharmacy except for the early hours. <laughs> That was, that was, kind of killer. When that when that came on board, um, and I learned about that, that was that was a deal breaker for me. So, um, and my fourth year, what is the P two year now? During the old master's program, we had a couple come from Houston um, to present on compounding. Um, Dave and Kay Sparks. Uh, Dave was the C is still the CEO of PCCA, and his wife, who was um, in charge of training um, compounding within the within the in the, within their facility and teaching pharmacists and technicians how to compound, uh, they came and visited. And within an hour's talk, my life changed. Uh, I realized this is what I want to do. I get to the ability to run a lab if we want to talk about it. It wasn't the traditional lab of organic and those types of things, but I get to run a lab. I get to uh, play there and, and experience making different dosage forms. And at the same time, uh, still have patient-centered care. I still be able to, to have that touch of patients and be able to really kind of own my own destiny and run my own pharmacy and, and do what I want to do from that aspect and not be able to, not be um, working the corporate side of things. And so 
like I said, in the span of an hour, my life changed, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And um, directly after pharmacy school, we started Hooks Apothecary with my sister Kathy um, in 1999 and ran that for uh, all the way through 2012, 2013. And at that point, uh, I decided to take a job with PCCA. And uh, we moved the family to Houston, um, spent five years down in Houston, and had many different hats down there. Um, was working in marketing at one point for a couple of subsidiary <clears throat> businesses that uh, PCCA owns. Went to into the training department, so I actually stepped into Case Barks' role um, and was overseeing the training of compounding pharmacists and compounding technicians and did that for a couple years. And then moved into leg le legislative and regulatory affairs. Uh, always had a bent for the law a little bit. I had a mind that understood regs and law and uh, being able to read that and um, synthesize law and be able to communicate that effectively to pharmacists uh, in a way that they would understand that was kind of a, a skill that I had. And so I took that and we started a public affairs group within PCCA, which I was a part of, and I was dealing with um, state legislative and regulatory affairs, was meeting with state boards of pharmacy and state pharmacy associations about where compounding was and where it needed to go. Um, and then spent one year with our um, trade association for compounding and was the executive director of that until that pull of Evansville came back and wanted to be back home and be back with family and moved back to Indiana and, and came back into the pharmacy and, and that's where I'm at today. So, yeah, Thank yeah. you so much for yeah. sharing, especially the moment when it clicked. I know for myself and for a lot of my peers, we have a lot of anxieties about am I going into the right thing? Am I doing what I want to be doing? And to hear that sometimes things just click. That, that was great to yeah, hear. Yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the current fields that students can expect to go into, like the growing fields coming up? Ah. Well, that's a great question. There's, there's a bunch of different ways. Um, they, can take this, they, they can take this degree and kind of really write their own story. Um, and that's one of the things I, I, I'm hoping through uh, the leadership forum today, what the, what the students learn from that through this podcast, um, through these various channels that, you know, opening their eyes to just opening their minds and their hearts to the, the, the possibilities that are out there. It's not just um, clinical hospital pharmacy work. It's not just community-based um, retail pharmacy work. There's a lot of different facets that can go into that. Uh, but in traditional pharmacy, I, I see, I can foresee in the next um, five to ten, 10 years a real shift in the way that we're practicing pharmacy. Um, we're seeing a lot coming um, down from Washington, D.C. In the, in the terms of reforms of various different things that I think will change the pharmacy practice model um, dramatically um, and the ability for pharmacists to really be able to practice to the top of their license, to be paid for their cognitive services, to be paid for their patient interactions, um, and not be so tied to um, the dispensing of medications. It's going to really kind of swing towards more of um, what we can use our mind for to be able to improve patients' lives and improve their, uh, their medication therapies going forward. Um, within the field of nuclear medicine, there's a whole new uh, channel of, of that and radiopharmaceuticals and things that, that are just coming on board that is exciting. Um, and that book is still yet to be written of what exactly that's going to mean and what it's going to uh, develop into. And so uh, it's an exciting time to be into pharmacy. Um, the current crop of pharmacy students that we have now, they're graduating. The pre-farm students that will be coming in the next two to three years, um, this is going to be a very, very interesting time for pharmacy. I think it's going to be overall very, very positive. Um, and I think we're going to see pharmacy moving into directions that, quite frankly, I don't know if we even can see right now that, that that's where um, our possibilities now, again, are an open book, uh, much like we've not seen oof, in the history of pharmacy. I don't think we've seen for 40, 50, 60 years. And so that's, that's going to be very, very interesting. From your standpoint, from what the college is talking to you and the experiences that you're seeing, is there... Are you, are you kind of coming to the same conclusions? Or is there something different that I'm, that I'm not mentioned or seen or heard from today that um, the pharmacy is talking, the school is, is talking about? Yeah, I think um, definitely with the, the nuclear pharmacy, I think that's going to be really big. I do a lot of work with Dr. Weatherman, so I might be a little biased. <laughs> 
Um, but I also think AI and just the advancing technology is going to play a really big role in the revolution of pharmacy. And I don't no. know if we can truly understand what that looks like yet. No. But I think that's going to be a big deal, especially once it gets more refined. We've had a lot of class assignments where you ask AI different pharmacy questions and then rate how reliable these responses are. As of right now, they're not always the best responses. <laughs> But in a, in a couple of years, even one year, it's crazy to think about what that's going to look like. Yeah, and that was one thing I didn't even scratch the surface of uh, today when I was talking with students is that, that possibility of AI, we just, I, I, I almost hazard to even talk about it because we just don't know where direction it's going to go into at this point. Um, we're seeing such new things come out and then things kind of get reeled back in. I was like, oh, that wasn't the direction we wanted to go. We need to go in a different direction. So I'm, I, as a business owner, I, I'm definitely aware of AI. We've experimented with it a little bit. Um, but we needed to come to a little bit more of, uh, what's a good word to it? Not fruition, but kind of it needs to, needs to age a little bit more for us to really kind of see, I think, where those tools are really going to be helpful for us. I think from a from a business owner standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, being able to write marketing copy and do things like that, that's where I've really played around with AI more than anything else. And it seems like that's a really fantastic tool to be able to um, tell it some prompts and for it to lay out three to four paragraphs of information that um, at the very onset is 90% there and just needs a little more massaging to, to go from there. That part's exciting for me, but as it relates to medicine you know, at its core, um, it's going to be exciting to see where those where that develops. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate your yeah. insights. Yeah. Um, so switching gears a little bit, <laughs> I know we talked about how you started in Evansville, went to Houston, you went back to Evansville. Could you tell me more about what you love about it? Love about what exactly? Like Evansville, oh, Southwest Evansville. Indiana. Yeah. Um, it's it's the typical smallest or smallest big town you've ever lived in, I guess is kind of the best way to describe it. it it's tough um, as, we're, as we're raising a family and raising children, uh, we've definitely gotten into that mindset of the teenagers wanting to leave home and wanting to explore other places. And I'm never, I, we've heard multiple, multiple times, we're never coming back to Evansville, we're never coming back to Indiana. And I, just, I look at them and I said, that was the same thing. When I left Evansville uh, when I was 18 to come up here, uh, my mindset definitely was never to come back to Evansville. Uh, but that pull of the hometown uh, sometimes is just too strong to overcome. And so uh, familiarity is one. I mean, it's just to be able to come back to your hometown. Family is another. I mean, that's, that's part of it. But Evansville is just very much that, a, a very good mix, um, of both that agricultural mindset, that very down-to-earth um, people of the land, if you want to say that, I put it of. Um, it's, it, it's a very strong German community on top of that. It's, it's very, until you experience it, it's kind of hard to describe what it is about, about Evansville, about southwestern Indiana that uh, is, a, is a strong draw, but that, that small town mentality. You know, people care for each other. Uh, people really look out for each other. The community is fairly tight-knit for the size that it is. We have an MSA of about 300,000 people. Um, so it's not a small town, but it has that feel. Um, but overall, family, the familiarity, just being able to come home and know this is home. It's always felt like home. That's what, that's what it, we came to. And that sense of belonging to the community is, is a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, so keeping on the line with famili familiarity, Purdue Day of Giving is coming up. <laughs> Very big day both for the College of Pharmacy and the university as a whole. Yeah. What's so special about Day of Giving to you? That's a fascinating question out of everything that's in here. And and when Purdue came Day of Living or Day of Living, <laughs> when Purdue Day of Giving came came online, um, I was very jaded about it. Uh, I was just kind of like, what are we doing? There's enough philanthropy going on. There's enough people giving back um, to Purdue. What what is the purpose of this? Um, I believe it came online when we were still in Houston, if I remember right, or we just came back to Indiana. So I was kind of a little bit distant from the university at that point, both um, physically and mentally. We hadn't been back to campus, so I didn't know exactly what was kind of going on. Um, and that first year, once it got done, I was just like, wow, this is, this is a day for the university to really come together um, and give back and have that feeling, <clears throat> even though you're 
in your home of Evansville or you're in Florida or you're in Australia or wherever you're at in the world to have that feeling of coming home to Purdue. And it's, it's if, unless you've participated in that and seen um, everything that Purdue puts out about Day of Giving um, through the different channels that they, they go through, through YouTube, through Facebook, through all the marketing channels, you don't really know what that experience is like. And when, you know, we make donations throughout the year to various things within, within the university, John Purdue Club and the School Pharmacy, and within APHA and Trap and Ski Club, which I was involved with at Purdue. Um, you know, we do that throughout the year, but that day when we, when we give, it, it just, it feels different. It feels like you've got, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head, you've got thousands, tens of thousands of people across the globe that are giving to Purdue on the same day. And it's just a really awesome feeling. And so if you've not participated in that before, uh, at least pay attention to what's going on that day and, and what is going on on campus that day. It's a fun day on campus from what I've seen. I want to be up here one of these days uh, while Day of Giving is going on because it, like it looks like it's a blast. Um, but it's just, I, it's, it's hard to describe when you click that button and you make the donation, you feel like you're a bigger part of a community versus you know, being in the middle of November and you're re-upping your John Purdue Club membership, it's, you know, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm supporting athletics again. Uh, great. <laughs> but it just feels different on that Purdue Day of Giving. So I, I'm interested to know what, as a, as a student, uh, what's that experience been like that um, to have that rally, that kind of that rallying going on around that specific day every April. Yeah, it really does feel like a holiday, like especially <laughs> just going around campus. I remember, I think it might have been, it was either last year or the year before, I was walking down 3rd Street, and um, someone in one of the Purdue, like, gators pulled up next to me, and they're like, would you like a lollipop? Happy day of giving. <laughs> And that was just one of those experiences. I was like, this is this is a holiday, and this is really one of the big days on the campus for the College of Pharmacy, for the entire university. We had a carnival one year. There was a Ferris wheel. Me and my friend, we stood in the shadow of the Ferris wheel playing, like, massive Jenga. <laughs> um, so it's just... It's a moment to kind of reflect on all of the accomplishments that the university has done, both the alumni and the students, and kind of just be, be thankful that Purdue has been such a big help for all of those. At least that's how I feel about it as a student. I know without being a Purdue student, I wouldn't be here with you today. <laughs> and there's a lot of other things in my career I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't be working in my nuclear pharmacy in Rhode Island without Purdue behind me. Um, so it's a day to be thankful for me, as well as just thankful for all of the people I get to know at Purdue, thankful for all of the things we're able to do together. Nice. That's very cool. That's uh, and like I said, one of these days we're going to make a trip and make a make it a point to come up here and experience that with, you know, either while our daughter is here at Purdue or or later on we're going to be we're going to come up and experience it full full board. We want to see it. We want to see yeah. how it goes. So I'm telling you, yeah. it's a holiday. You got to make <laughs> it. You put it in your calendar. All right, I have one final question for okay. you. So I've been told you're a big sports fan, specifically Purdue sports. If you could have dinner with any coach or player in any of Purdue sports history, who would it be and why? So this was, um, we were talking a little bit earlier, this was the question that I focused on the most because I, I, I wanted a, <clears throat> I wanted not only a good answer, but I wanted something that really that really resonated more to me as a, in, in my heart. And so you could sit there as a student that went through the mid 90s um, here at Purdue, you know, you could rattle off Gene Cady and Glenn Robinson and uh, Drew Brees, and um, <laughs> we, we, we were a big fan of Stu Schwaggart when he was here playing football. Uh, Dean, Dean Barker brought that up during, our, during the presentation today. It was kind of weird how all that kind of comes back around. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that we got to see play or we, we saw on television play or make such of an impact on, on Purdue Athletics. Joe Tiller, um, you know, it would have it been really cool to meet him and, and have, to, and have a, a meal with him. Um, to get his story coming from Wyoming and kind of just reinventing football, Big Ten football and what it meant. And it was no longer going to be just uh, five yards in a cloud of dust and run the ball all the time. We're going to open this up and actually have a passing game, which then brought in Drew Brees and brought in Kyle Orton and brought in all these greats that we had in the early 2000s. Um, I've been lucky enough to meet a couple people, uh, just happenstance that 
Uh, we've, I've met Gene Cady in just a weird situation when Purdue was at the Elite Eight in Louisville uh, a couple years ago. I got to meet Brian Cardinal, who was one of my favorite players um, when I was here at Purdue. And, and shortly after that, he's, uh, the, the custodian was near and dear to my heart when he was a player and, and a great individual. So when I approached this question, I'm like, well, I mean, there's always that chance. There's going to be that that weird thing that somehow me and Drew Brees or some we're we're in some place with Drew Brees and I get to meet him. I'm like, we check that checklist off. So I finally came down. Um, the the person I would want to meet most would be John Wooden, um, both from a basketball standpoint, his career here at Purdue, his career at UCLA, and that run, the incredible run that he had at UCLA. Uh, but then his leadership and coaching fundamentals, the pyramid that he invented that's outside here at Mollenkamp, um, you know, just to get the insight of, you know, putting that together. How did you do that? How did this come together for you? Um, I've unfortunately, I've read some about him, but I've not gone, have not had a chance to ever do a deep dive on his history or, or really kind of his leadership part. That's what I've, that's one of my, my, uh, bucket list to do is kind of really get deep into John Wooden and how he developed all that. But um, what a fascinating, fascinating individual to have gone through Purdue, graduated here, had a great basketball career here, uh, but then just make that 10, 100,000 times more than what it was with that career at UCLA. Um, and to touch so many people with his leadership mentality. I know Coach Painter relies on the pyramid a lot with what he does here. I know there's thousands of coaches that do the same thing. And to have that kind of thing that you did. Um, it'd be awesome to meet him when he was, right before he went to go coach UCLA and he goes, I got this thing. I know what I want to do. You know, that, that excitement that he's got this thing on paper and I know this is where it is, is this is what's going to work. To catch him in that moment, that would be fascinating. And that's where I would, that would be who I'd go for. So. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. answer. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It has been an absolute honor having you here on the podcast. Okay. And I know everyone is really excited to listen to your story. I, I appreciate it. The honor has been all mine. And uh, look forward to seeing what uh, Purdue Pharmacy does with this space and what you do with your career. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you.